With desperate Brits being flown out of Sudan with horrifying stories of what they've seen, our audience here tonight is asking, has the government been too slow in getting them out? Tonight, we're in Greenford in West London, that's in the borough of Ealing, once known as the Queen of Suburbs. At local and national level, it's an area dominated by Labour. But our audience here, as always, is a reflection of the broad electoral map of the country. And they are also asking, is the Bank of England right to say that we all just have to accept being poorer? And when is one man's bully another man's strong leader? Welcome to Question Time. Rachel McLean. She's been housing minister since February and became the sixth person to hold the post in the past year. After a previous career at HSBC and in IT, she was elected MP for Redditch in 2017. She's also worked in the Home Office, Work and Pensions and the Treasury. Labour's shadow for levelling up housing and communities is Lisa Nandy. She's in her 14th year as an MP for Wigan. If elected to government, she said she'd create a private renter's charter, which would increase the rights of tenants. Leila Moran is one of the 14 Liberal Democrat MPs MPs in the Commons. Having run for her party's leadership in 2019, she now speaks to the Lib Dems on foreign affairs, science and technology. And Camilla Tomney has two big jobs. During the week, she's the associate editor of the Daily Telegraph, which includes a weekly column. At the weekend, she presents a Sunday morning political programme on GB News. Good evening from Greenford. Welcome to our panellists. Welcome to our audience here. Great to see you. And of course, welcome to you at home. As always, we are on social media. And as well as being on BBC One, we are live on iPlayer First. That's at 8 pm every Thursday night. Now, of course, as always, our panel do not know the questions, do you, that you're going to be facing. So let's hear our first one. <laughs> Intake of breath there from Camilla. Let's hear our first one from Daniel McEwen. Has the government acted quickly enough in the evacuation of British nationals from the Sudan? We've heard some horrendous stories, haven't we, over the last few days? Rachel, has the government been too slow? Um, so, uh, I think what people need to understand is this is an extremely fluid situation that's happening. It is a civil war. It's a very dangerous civil war. Um, and I know from listening to the Foreign Secretary and the Defence Secretary just how much work has gone into evacuating those people that have been removed from the country. And, uh, and, and I know that people are extremely grateful to our, our brave armed forces who are going into that country and putting themselves at risk in order to evacuate British nationals and British passport holders. So as well, why, as did, well as why did we end up in a situation where the UK is... And no one's disputing how difficult this is, of course. But the UK's first evacuation flight didn't take off till Tuesday afternoon. And Germany had already completed its evacuation by then of something like 600 people. Why were they quicker off the mark than we So I think it's really unfair to make that kind of comparison when we're all sitting here in London and we haven't got people with live sniper fire firing at us. I mean, but I'm thinking... I know, I'm, I'm, but it's a I, fair question, I'm, I'm, isn't I'm it? I'm thinking of those soldiers... You know, I'm a mum of young men. I'm thinking of those young men and those young people that are going out there and putting their lives at risk to bring out in an, in an exercise that's quite an unprecedented and very difficult exercise to bring out our citizens. And I think they're doing a fantastic job. But no, look, no other... one is criticising the armed forces. So, look, other... But, 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 but the people in... Sudan, the British nationals, they're asking these questions as, as, as well as uh, Daniel over So we, there. Have, we have brought out, I think, the latest... We've got flights coming out all the time. Uh, I, I had an update just before I came here and I think there have been something like 900 citizens being brought out. And, of course, we are calling on uh, the warring parties to, to keep that ceasefire going and allow that ceasefire to continue for a bit longer so we, can br we want to bring out more okay. people. And of, and, of course, it's an extremely fluid situation and we can we can all sit here and, and sort of commentate but actually we don't know what's going on on the ground daniel what do you you ask the question what do you make of that response yeah i think uh, you know this country it, it, although our intentions are good we uh, we get involved in iran iraq and we're, we're quick we're quick to respond there but when there's a problem with uh, refugees coming back to this country we see we seem to be slow okay lisa lisa nandy um 
I mean, I, I don't know why it's taken us longer than other European countries to evacuate our citizens, but I, mean, I very think it's not fair to I make that comparison. Do you think it is? No, 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 I think, I think, that's, just, I think that's a, a question of fact, but where I think it, she is right is that it's an incredibly fluid and dangerous situation. We've got <sighs> British troops currently flying into danger in order to evacuate people. I think the Foreign Secretary was right to move swiftly to evacuate British diplomats, because my previous experience of these situations, particularly in the evacuation of Afghanistan, is that British diplomats and officials that have helped the British government are of, often at most risk, and so I would absolutely support the government in those efforts. I think what troubles me watching what is unfolding, though, particularly listening to Andrew Mitchell, the International Development Minister, this morning, is that what we saw in Afghanistan was that the, the difficulties that we encountered were often because different government ministers in different government departments couldn't work together. And what I don't want to see is a repeat of that. We left people behind in Afghanistan because different government ministers weren't talking to one another. You had the Defence Secretary moving heaven and earth to get people out, and the Foreign Secretary, who was on holiday. This morning, we had the International Development Minister saying that the government was going to make sure that there were safe and legal routes for Sudanese refugees, and then you immediately had the Home Secretary saying, no, there won't be. I think we need to learn the lessons from Afghanistan. I think we need to do it very quickly, and if the government does that, they'll have our full support. Camilla. Well, I've got a colleague at The Telegraph, uh, Mutaz Ahmed, who has got relatives in Sudan, and he's written a piece for us this week where he describes a situation where um, his cousin was waiting for help and he had to contact him and say, don't wait for help, just get out yourself, and he is now safe in Egypt. And the picture that Mutaz um, paints is one where British citizens in Sudan weren't given any help for several days after Hermeti had that's this fallout. But that's his, he, he spoke, you know, with respect, I think, because he has got Sudanese relatives and he's spoken to this cousin, they were completely kept in the dark for several days. It might just be their isolated incident, but of course there's a degree of discomfort when you see diplomats being evacuated while 4,000 British citizens remain behind so fending for the themselves. diplomats were in the embassy and, and people well, were well, scattered all over the... The ambassador was on holiday and is now managing the situation from home in Wimbledon. And he's now, the one that's actually able to broker the ceasefire. And, the, and, and the he's deputy working head of mission to, to do that. But, but and Rachel, I think the, the we're deputy all head of mission wasn't hang there on, either. Hang on, you're both talking about it. The, the deputy head of mission wasn't there either. So you had an unfortunate set of circumstances where the people leading the embassy weren't actually there. Now, you could say that they weren't to know that, obviously, you have the fallout of these two effectively military despots and that it's going to happen at that particular time. Having said that, there were signs of this for weeks mm. before. The most depressing thing about the situation in Sudan is three to four years ago, you had Sudanese professionals, you had lawyers, you had doctors, you had teachers taking to the streets, asking for a more democratic form of government. And what happened, actually, is the Western world didn't seize that opportunity. Instead, they, 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 they um, took away the sanctions that had been applied. They tried to support, support what has now turned out effectively to be an axis of evil. And who's been left to suffer? Not just the British citizens in Sudan, but the Sudanese people themselves. So I don't think it's been a particularly good exercise in the management of an, a complex situation with a history dating back not just weeks and months, but years. So there was a degree of predictability about it, and those who should have been at their posts weren't. And Leila, not only is there the issue raised by Daniel about has the government been too slow, but also now we're hearing a number of, of Brits lamenting the fact they've not been able to bring their, their relatives, and particularly I, elderly I, relatives, with them. I literally have this as a constituent case. Um, so I have a uh, constituent contact me. Her daughter is in Sudan. Her husband is Sudanese with their British child. They've spent all their money to get to Khartoum Airport. They're there, as far as I'm aware, still now, and they won't let them on the plane with the husband. And separating, and I quote, is not an option. So they're completely stuck and they don't have any more money to be able to get back to anywhere. I have another one where they applied for British citizenship. They're, in fact, the son of a Brit. They sent off their papers to the Home Office to get their, uh, to get their British passport. And because the Home Office has been a bit slow <laughs> over the last year, didn't get the papers back. And it's literally computer says no. So what I would like to see on that point is there are a group of people that need exceptional visas. The other one is Sudanese doctors who work in the NHS are out there 
because there, there was Ramadan recently, so many of them went out to celebrate Eid with their families. They can't get back. There are, they are residents of this country and they are not why being allowed back have, on the flights. Why it's aren't they allowed? I don't think they, they must have visas to work here. They have visas, but they're not allowing them on the flights because they're only allowing British citizens with passports on the flights. And I think what the government needs to do now is make a guarantee to those people in the first instance. And then separate to that, there is to the point the gentleman made about refugees, there is then separately, we need to be talking about safe and legal routes because there will be people, remember, you know, we have a colonial tie to that part of the world. There are people who have family here and while it is so unsafe, want to be able to get here for safety, they'll go back. But we need a safe and legal right. well, let's, Otherwise... let's, let's put this to, to Rachel yeah. then, because if you've got your sitting... So there's two things there. Is, is Leila right that, that NHS doctors, for example, in Sudan, who've got visas to work here, aren't being allowed to come back? And what about, and I know Labour has asked this, what mm. about allowing people who have got British passports to bring vulnerable relatives with them? So what I understand, I think we, di we all need to remember that, of course, we want to do absolutely everything we can to get vulnerable people out. And our own troops have put their lives in danger. Don't forget there were no troops there. There was no military equipment there. There were no, there were no aircraft carriers or planes actually stationed there. So the comparisons to Afghanistan are completely irrelevant in but this situation. But in terms situation. of the two points I've asked you specifically... But I'm just coming on to that because it's <coughs> relevant. So the, it may have been the case that other countries had military equipment there. It may have been a completely different operational situation for them. In terms of what I've been told about the situation on the ground... They're doing everything to get people out. If people can get to the airport... No, I'd no, be, but I, I'm not asking you that, Rachel. What I'm asking very specifically, do, and, and it may be that you don't know, I appreciate this is not your area of I, specialism, but is, is Leila right? And if you don't know, feel free I, to say I don't know. I'm coming on to answer Well, let, that, that, those are the two things I'm asking. I'm, are, have, if people who work in this country who've got visas to work here but happen to be in Sudan, are they not being allowed back? And what? secondly, will the government allow British citizens to bring vulnerable I am with literally them? answering that question. What I have been told... Well, I hadn't on, heard it so far, the, forgive me, the, but I'm, 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 I'm on waiting. The ground, on the ground, there is a, a degree of discretion, is what I've been told. If people can get to the airport and they are there and they are vulnerable or they're British citizens, they are being allowed to board planes, and I have been told that that is the case. And there are some people in that situation... We have brought hundreds of people out already. This is what so happened in Afghanistan. This is exactly what happened. It's a completely different because situation, different Lisa. Because you had no, not talking no, to one another. No, no. So the, the Home Office was saying no. no can I just the let me finish? Saying, yes. So the Prime Minister has convened COBRA multiple times, twice in a day. All the ministers are there. I actually attended COBRA myself. All the ministers are there talking to each other with the ambassador with the head of the army, the special forces, as you would expect. So this then you the, do. So, so is the a, answer is, it's a kind a, of... But, but Rachel, the, that's... And I want to answer your second point as but well. But so in terms of... So just so I'm clear. So in terms of people who are not British citizens, but maybe a, a vulnerable relative, an elderly person or a child, it's a question of whether the people on the ground think they'll... Yeah, and that, by the way, that's not what the Foreign Secretary said on the floor of the House today. No. So, the, so what you're telling us now is different to what was literally said Forgive a few hours me, ago. Forgive me, I would absolutely go with what the Foreign Secretary said on the floor of the House. He is the foreign... <laughs> uh, I mean, come on, don't... So that's that they can't that's what come. I just, that's what, but that's he what I was foreign, describing. He is the Foreign Secretary, and obviously he is coordinating. I'm a government minister who's responsible Are you clear? for housing. <laughs> Are you clear what's happening? Well, uh, I mean, well, with respect, I think that's there a has been some I'm coming here to talk about the, the national response, which I think has been incredibly well organised, because we have got people out at very short notice. We have developed and implemented our response. We have actually airlifted from having nothing there. We've airlifted people out. No, no, out. you've We've made that point, and, and it's country. a point well made. I guess what we're Rachel. trying to understand is, is who can come out. And we've got, we've got the Foreign Secretary, the Foreign Secretary saying one very thing clear. and the Home well, Secretary look, saying one thing and you're saying another. We have to prioritise our British people on our British nationals because if you put one person on a plane, that's a seat that cannot be taken up by somebody else. And I think most people would expect us to get British citizens and British nationals and their dependents but out. But Layla's I think point that's is that what some of them can't get out because they have to leave behind dependents or others. Well, and, and that was exactly what and happened. And it's clearly a very difficult situation. And I know that they will be doing absolutely everything they can to get people out. But when there is okay. limited resources, you have to you have to prioritise. But just somehow, briefly, it that, is a war zone. That People confusion. Being shot at. That confusion between Andrew Mitchell talking about safe routes mm. and then Suella Braverman ruling them out 
Where does that leave us? I think you're trying to make this into a sort of personality psychodrama, no, which, with all. respect, is completely wrong. You've just got different this ministers is, saying different things. Jeff, this is, which which this is, is the right answer? This is a military operation, and at the end of the day, the, the people on the ground in Sudan our military personnel are the ones who are leading with that, being directed by the Prime Minister through the Nobody all the is usual challenges the military. In a, in a, right, you shouldn't okay. be leaving the military in a position where they're having to turn people away for lack of clarity okay. because government... I am absolutely agree. sure there will be clarity on the ground because the military are organising this on right. the ground. I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to take a few quick five points from the audience, if I may. Yes, you've got your hand up here. Yeah, so I work in a local school which welcomes people from all over the world when they need to get to take safe refuge. To be honest, the, the, your, your response just then, it shows no clarity at all. And it does remind me of what our Afghani peoples have had to suffer. It has taken them 10 months to get into school. We, we, we were responsible for 20 years of, of disruption in Afghanistan, and those people trusted us to get them out. They were abandoned at airports, they've been left in hotels. Now, that, now they're being used as propaganda about, oh, there's too many people coming. It makes me so angry that when young people need an education, and we, are, we have a proud record of being a nation that's, that is a place of refuge, mm. that we are shutting the door, and we, haven't, we, are, we are not doing what we ought to be doing okay. as a country. Let me hear a bit more. The man there in the glass. <laughs> I think the government's response has been, you know, very slow and appalling. I agree with the lady's point there. What happened in Afghanistan is what was going to happen in Sudan. And the man there in the green top. Um, I would just say that we have been the last to act. The Germans have already criticised us and said we went in <clears> without <throat> permission, so there's been no negotiation. And this isn't the first time we've done it. We're meant to be, we're meant to be really efficient. We're meant to have the best armed forces in the world. Okay. And the, the, man, the man there in the blue, at the, at the side, with the, I think you've got a blue top on, I can't quite tell. Yeah. yeah having served in Afghanistan myself, uh, the, I, I believe the reason uh, there's a big difference between what happened in Afghanistan and what happened in Sudan. Yeah. Because the people in Afghanistan, uh, they served with us for 20-odd like 20, 20 years, yeah. and then we abandoned them, a lot of them. Whereas Sudan, we've got no troops on the ground at the moment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for your points. I'm going to move on and take another question. I've got quite a few to get through, but I just want to let you know before I do that next week we are in Telford in Shropshire. And the week after that we are in Bexhill on Sea. Get all over the place on the south coast. So if you'd like to come to any of those programmes, the list is on our BBC website. Just go directly to the website and you can see the list uh, of, of all the programmes, in fact, where we're going to be. If you'd like to come along and be part of our audience, you can apply there. Right, let's take our second question now, which is from Sunil Rassam. Hi. Hi. I would like to ask the panel. Is it a bit rich for the rich to tell us to accept being poorer? <laughs> well, so what you're referring to, Sunil, aren't you, is these comments by the Bank of England's chief economist, Hugh Pill, who, paraphrasing what he says, he's basically saying people in the UK need to, 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 to accept that we're all worse off and we have to take our share and that we need to stop trying to get a pay rise because that's going to make everyone poorer and businesses equally need to stop putting their prices up. Camilla. <laughs> well, um, there is obviously a legitimate economic argument for saying that if everybody is given inflation-busting pay rises, then it's only going to serve to fuel inflation and make everything even more expensive than it already has been. But I think when you've got a situation where the tax burden is at an all-time high, the highest since the Second World War, and most people are looking at their pay packets and thinking they're not getting enough of their money back in their pocket, and they're going to the supermarket and dealing with sky-high prices, and they're dealing with energy bills that they can't afford to pay, and they're running vehicles, possibly, uh, with ever-increasing fuel prices and, indeed, the cost of train fares alone as well has gone up, you can't blame people for asking for pay rises. I think the issue for the government, and we've got teacher strikes today and then again next week and a debate over those, is where does one set the percentage rise in order for it to be fair for the public sector workers who feel that they are inadequately rewarded, but also to be fair to the private sector who are going to struggle to get pay rises if the firms that they're working for are struggling in the current economic climate. I think there does have a, to be a sense of kind of collectivism that we do know that at the moment things are pretty difficult for very many different reasons, some perhaps of the government's making, some perhaps of the world's making, if you consider the Ukraine war, 
the post-pandemic environment and all the rest of it. But um, do we want to hear from people on six-figure salaries that people on much less money should not be asking for more money? No, probably not. And I think, you know, it was a very, very clumsy and insensitive way of expressing himself. Lisa. I mean, I don't think anyone in this country would argue for a moment that Britain isn't worse off after 13 years of Tory government. It's only been a few months since Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng crashed the economy, sent interest rates through the roof and left hundreds of thousands of people paying hundreds of pounds more on their mortgages every month. We're all paying the price for that. Mm -hmm. What I will never accept is that, once again, working people should pay the price for those failures. The truth is that this is about political choices. We could have a windfall tax on the profits of big oil and gas producers and we could help people with their energy costs or the rising council tax costs or any of the other costs that are going up right now. We could end non-dom tax status and get money into our National Health Service, help to deal with the current disruption in the National Health Service and provide some light on the hill for those frontline workers who have been holding us together through COVID, holding us together through a decade of austerity and are now currently having to choose between feeding their own families or caring for ours. But the government, isn't, isn't the government knows what this is saying about. something the government, to some the, public sector workers that is similar to what Hugh Pill is saying? No, I mean, the, West, well, so the health secretary, the, the shadow health secretary, sorry, we're treating, is saying to junior doctors, for example, who are asking for 35%, he said, he said look, hand on heart, I couldn't offer you 35% if I was in power. And they're saying, well, if we don't get 35%, we are going to be worse off. And so Wes is saying, well, realistically, yes, you are going to have to accept being worse off. That I, is actually I, what he's saying. I think everyone in this country is, is currently accepting the fact that there is pain that <coughs> they're bearing. The question is, where is the hope? Where is the plan? Where, uh, where is the plan to start getting resources into our frontline workforce. You know, look at the teacher strike at the moment. We've got a real problem here. We've got lots of kids suffering severe disruption. We've got lots of teachers really struggling to make ends meet. And we've got teachers leaving the profession for nine out of the last ten years. The government hasn't been able to recruit enough secondary school teachers. What does it mean? It means everybody suffers. And the government knows that you could make different choices because they made choices. But would Labour the make budget. the choice to give all... A, hang on, Lisa. Would Labour make the choice to give get, all these people they, the, pay rises no, as high as inflation? No, look, we, I'm not going to start promising promising that we'll open no, negotiations live on television. No, but... I'm, not, I'm not expecting you to do that. But nonetheless, if you've got people who are asking for above inflation pay rise, I haven't heard Labour saying, yes, we will, idea, we, we will, would do that. We In will, which case, we will what never, Hugh Pill we says will, is a reality. No, sorry, we will never make promises that we don't know that we can keep, because this is people's money and they haven't got a lot okay. of it. Well, but what we would never do in the face of the falling living standards real terms wages and a cost of living crisis is give a £1 billion tax cut to the richest 1%. I just think that is unconscionable. Um, not everybody is getting poorer. There are 20% more billionaires in this country now than there were before the pandemic. OK. And they're getting a tax Man cut. here in the front. It's the second... Uh insensitive comment by someone from the Bank of England. I do uh, uh, deliveries for a local charity to people who are uh, vulnerable and uh, people are struggling to make, make ends meet. So one is, the, uh, one is what the bank does, the second is uh, uh, the whole aspect of insensitive comments. I think it's a very insensitive comment. Mm. Okay. Leila. So Sunil's question was, is it a bit rich? I mean, I think it does show that he doesn't do as much door knocking as me, <laughs> that's for sure. Um, I keep coming across people, and I dare say it's local elections coming up next week, but this is the top issue that keeps coming up on doors and stories that just break your heart. I um, had a lady who, she herself works in a nursery. She's got two kids herself uh, being taken care of in a childcare setting. Um, she has medication she needs to buy, and the perverse choice that she had to make this week was does she go to the pharmacy to get her depression medication or does she go to the supermarket to put food on the table for her children because she no longer can afford to do both? That is the Britain that this Conservative government has left us with. There are many choices that can be made and the one, for example, to release the cap on bankers' bonuses was not one that I think is the right one. Whenever you've 
seen what they do with the economy on taxation, whatever else. What they do is they put stealth taxes in. It's not progressive. It's not protecting the most vulnerable. And we are now faced in a situation where the country is just not working and we just need to get them out. And that's why many people are not voting Conservative for the first time, some of them, in these local elections. They're turning to the Lib Dems in my area, certainly. And this is the top issue as to why. Let's hear a bit more from our audience. Yes, uh, the woman there. Would MPs consider giving public services such as nurses and teachers the same pay rise that they have received? All right, we'll, 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 we'll ask in a minute. Yes, the man at the back with the glasses and the stripy tie, I think you've got. Yes, it was zero. So my question was, not my question, my comment was going to be, it is definitely in terms of political choice. So we were told after the last financial crash, like 10 years ago, OK, you have to put up with, like, no pay rises for now. So it's been 10 years on. So my generation, so I, I would have graduated about 2010, we've never had a pay rise in line with inflation. Like, people are putting off having families, buying yeah. homes, all of that stuff. And when you look... I think the other part of it is looking at the consequences of these political decisions. So yeah. if, for example, you put the burden of tax on those who are the most vulnerable, they are going to have to choose between doing very extreme things, like, do I buy my medication, do I buy food? If you put the tax burden on the very rich, it's like, OK, I have a slightly smaller bank balance at the end of the year, but you're still rich. You're still a billionaire. And the other thing I'd like to say, when, when I say rich, I don't mean people who are on, like, 100,000, 200,000. We're talking about the people who have billions. Like, you have people in this country who have billions. You can never spend it in a lifetime. You can never spend it in 10 lifetimes. Like, why is it that you're then putting the burden on people who have no money? Like, it doesn't make sense. I cannot believe how insensitive that comment is mm -hmm. when you are having people in our Great Britain who cannot afford to eat and heat. Our elderly population, our, our parents, our grandparents have to decide, do I put the heating on or do I eat? In Great Britain, not acceptable. I understand times are tough and we have to tighten our belts for a short period of time. How long for, though? How long are we going to be in this situation? And what is the government going to do about it? But also, what is the Bank of England going to do about it? Because the other thing that Hugh Pill didn't acknowledge when he made this comment is the role that the Bank of England has played in this. The gentleman there referenced 2008. You know, the Bank of England has presided over ultra-low interest rates and huge amounts of quantitative easing that has pushed inflation up. And yet there seems to be no responsibility at all taken for that. Um, <laughs> So, Rachel, as you give universal objection to what Hugh Hill mm. had to say, people find it insensitive, I can see why. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, when you think about the government's negotiations with public sector workers, that is exactly what you're asking the public sector to do, is to accept being poorer. So I think it obviously... You might not phrase it like that, but that is actually the reality. So I think it's obviously a, a, an insensitive, a insensitive comment. Um, and look, the government recognises that times are tough. We've had a global pandemic. We've had Putin's illegal and brutal war in Ukraine, and these factors have Brexit. impacted our economy. Um, no, not no. Brexit's it's nothing to do with, with Brexit. Brexit. Um, it's we, nothing we to have do had, with Brexit. We have had a very difficult time. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes, it is. Not all of it, but a bit. But I don't really think it's the right time to be rerunning a referendum that we had many years ago, where the country deal, voted to leave the European Union. I can't believe we're bringing it back. The Liberal Democrats want to overturn a democratic referendum that we had. Go back I, into the I European not... Union. Uh, that's quite astonishing. But getting back to the sorry, economy... Sorry, sorry. I, think, I think what Lily was saying was that she was disputing that, that whether Brexit had anything to do with the current economic situation. You're saying it has nothing to do Are you saying it has with... nothing to do with the fact that in G20 countries we are now behind Russia in terms of growth? Nonsense. What anyway, could possibly okay. be you don't accept it's, 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 it. Fair no, enough. No, I don't. And uh, actually, some economists do, but I accept that you, know, you don't accept it. Including the Bank of England, England should look, say. But, but the, point, <laughs> the point is, Hugh Pill has made these comments. He's the chief economist of the Bank of England. People find it, uh, are finding it insensitive and unacceptable. 
But what the fact is, asking, what he's what saying is, going, is, is right, isn't he? Because that's asked, exactly what the government is asking. What a people, of people have to do. asked in the audience is, what is the government going to do about it? And I think that's the important point here. We have got these global shocks that have affected the economy, and that's why the Prime Minister's priorities are to get inflation down. Because if we get inflation down, that is how we deal with the cost of living crisis, all the costs that people are talking about. And that is also why we have made all the cost of living payments available. People's energy bills are only half of what they would be because of the help the government has put into everybody's pockets and everybody's energy bills. The average family has received something like £3,000 worth of help from the government to help people through these really tough times. But ultimately, what we need to do is grow the economy, get our debt down so that we can invest more in public services and get inflation down. And those are the things that this government is focused on doing. Right. How are we doing? Half an hour. I'm going to take about three quick comments from you and then I'm going to move on because there's lots of questions there you want to get through. Let me get to my to you, uh, Madam, in the front there. Yes. Um, I mean, Brexit has been a shock to the economy but, and uh, a lot of politicians are not acknowledging that. And so how can we deal with that shock if nobody's acknowledging it? OK. Woman here in the front of the glass. The Conservative MP made the comment that our energy bills are only half as they should be because of the contributions made by the government. But that's actually not the case. I have to tell you, my energy bills have gone up way more than that. Yeah, the point is the, the support the government has given you has helped, has helped take off some of that cost. No, it hasn't. Money, actually, my, my energy bills were probably around £400 a month. They are now standing about, at about £700. I, I accept so. that. The bills have gone up because of what Putin's done in Ukraine. But the government's support has made that the fact that your energy bills are lower than they would have been had you not had any government support. It's a drop support. in the ocean. Yeah. I, I it's accept a it's a ocean. difficult time. £67 but it is government is support. It is help ocean. for people to pay their energy bills up and down the country. Yeah. Every person who's paying energy bills has had money from the government to help them. Yeah. And the woman at the, at the back there. In the... Hello. Um, I'm a teacher um, working in Ealing and I found it very... Um, Upsetting to hear that we're, you're saying that we have, the, and Hugh Pill is saying that um, we have to uh, have a reduction in our in our income and our earnings. But also, we have been obviously <coughs> teachers have been, um, you know, asking for more pay. But not only pay. To hear that Gillian Keegan as well is saying to us that that pay rise that they are offering yeah. us or proposing to give us, which is very... It's not going to cover um, the, our... I mean, the cuts to our salary, and I'm trying to speed up here, but, but also the fact that it's insulting to say to us that it's going to come from our school budgets and that the school budgets that have all been already been run down since 2010, and apparently the funding I heard, and it's, I, I looked it up, um, it was 5.5% uh, of GDP... Um, that was being funding funding education um, in 2010, and actually now it's and maybe the panel can ask, answer this question. It's actually why is it now 4.4% going into education, and and they're telling us that it's got to come from the school budgets and the things that I see in school, and and I hear happening in schools. Um, these schools have had cuts over the last 13 yeah. years. To then say to us. Again, it's got to come from the children's resources, and that means teachers and the shortages that we have already had for 13 years. And they've said it's because of austerity. Um, it's just risible. Well, and as you say, teachers are on strike today, yeah. aren't they? So, the and, and there are more, more strikes to come. I'm going to, if you forgive me, I'm going to move on and take oh. another, another question. Uh, before I do, I just need to let you know that, um, gosh, question time is getting everywhere. We're now on the BBC Sounds app. <laughs> Tell you. <laughs> Wherever you go, you can watch and listen to this programme. So, yes, we're now on the BBC <laughs> Sounds app. So, so, yes, we're available as a podcast. Everyone's doing podcasts these days. We thought we would as well. So, if you'd like to um, listen to BBC Question Hour, if you can't, obviously, if you're listening to me now, you're watching it now. But if you're really not, and you'd like to listen to it on a podcast, or who knows, you'd like to watch it again, uh, you, can, you can listen to it on BBC Sounds. Right, let's take a question from Kyle Hartnett, please. When will the government get a grip of the housing crisis affecting young people? So, uh, Kyle, looking at you... <laughs> you're, you're how old, Kyle? Sorry. How old are you? Uh, 18. 18. And so you're describing it as a crisis. T tell me how, how it seems to you. Well, the hope of me owning my ho own home in the next eight years, when I'm 
26 is just seems impossible to me. The, the prices are extortionate. Even renting is just crazy in London. I don't see how it's fair that young people don't get the same chances their parents had to buy their homes. I just think it's unfair and the government should be ashamed of their record. OK, well, uh, Rachel, I'll come to you. Lisa, how, how would you help Kyle? Well, I, I think you're right. Um, on current trends, a child born today has less than a one in three chance of owning their own home by the age of 50. And I think that is totally unfair, immoral and unsustainable in a modern country. How can you be sure of that figure? I mean, we but, can't have any idea. Should because, we be projecting that far? No, okay. because, because we've looked back at the trends from 2010, when the Conservatives took office, to now. And on current trajectory, with the fall off of house building, with the fall off of home ownership, we're seeing the situation go significantly backwards from where it was in the 1980s to where it is now. So on current trends, if we don't do something to reverse these trends, we're going to have even more of a crisis facing his generation. And what I would say to you is this, that you've got to look at the housing situation in the round because the whole thing is an utter mess. We've had 15 housing ministers since 2010. We've had six housing ministers in the last year. I've got tins in my cupboard that have lasted longer than some of these <laughs> ministers and so, cru crucially some of their policies as well. We so could what, sort what out, would you do? We, I mean, the, we the could, basic could, problem we for could, you, Carl, is that, that it's unaffordable. We could, so would you want to bring house yeah, prices down we, in some way? The, we, the, is the, that what you'd the, like to see? The crisis is in affordability and we could sort that out tomorrow. We could introduce a permanent scheme of state-backed mortgage insurance to help people who make very high rental payments faithfully for long periods of time but don't have deposits to make the leap into home ownership. Other countries would do it, we could do it too. We could help people right now who are in the private rented sector, which has become the Wild West, by legislating to raise standards in the private rented sector and putting an immediate ban on unfair no-notice evictions. We could mend the deliberate vandalism of our council housing stock. We've got a million people on social housing waiting lists in this country and we've seen our social housing stock depleted year on year on year. And we could change this absurd definition of affordability because the government will tell you that they've put money into affordable housing but what they won't tell you is that 90% of that money has gone into affordable not social housing and that means houses that are currently at 80% of market rent well in this borough of Ealing a rental accommodation an average rental property that is deemed affordable is over £450 a week. I don't know in whose world that is affordable, but that has got to change. And what sort of time frame... <laughs> what sort of time frame are you talking about? Should you, should you win the next election? I mean, you know, say, for example, Kyle's renting and you would help him use the sort of credit, if you like, from that rent to be able to get, in, get uh, to buy a house, but there isn't enough housing stock. Yep. You want to create more social housing stock. Are we talking about after 10 years, that this might be sorted out? No, so we... you say we do it right now, but you couldn't we, do it right we've, now. We've set a target to uh, restore home ownership to 70% of the population within the first term of a Labour government. We would legislate in the first 100 days to raise standards in the private rented sector to deal with the crisis that a lot of people are dealing with now. And we're already working with developers, investors, councils and planning authorities to see what we can do to hit the ground running so, on day one of a Labour government so to how get many homes houses built would you in need, this country. So how many houses would you need to build in those four years in order to... to do that. Well, the government's the government the figure the government's just abandoned was three hundred thousand. How, how it, many it, would you it have to never build? it never met that figure, and it's not clear where they got it from. So we're working with the industry at the moment to work out how many housing uh, how many houses we would need to build year on year in order to meet housing need. But the crucial thing is this: it's not just enough to boost supply, and we're committed to building houses in the middle of a housing crisis. You've got to build the sort of homes that people can afford to buy. And this definition of affordable is utterly absurd and it needs to change. Lena. So, to Kyle's question, I mean, it's just insane in London, isn't it? It's like a grand for a one-bedroom flat, uh, one bedroom in a flat that you share with other people. That's before bills, right? So where is the money meant to come from for anything else, let alone saving for that deposit? And I've got uh, my younger sister's in that position. I know loads of people in that position. And it kind of feels like that social contract has been broken because the life that your parents had, you can't, you just, it's just nowhere close. To the solution, shelter 
uh, the charity has estimated that we need uh, something like 150,000 new homes a year at least. And the focus for the Liberal Democrats would be on homes for social rent. The reason why that's often not... I mean, the government set an a target, which it hasn't met, of 300,000, but you're saying that's way too many, you need half that. No, it's, that. It's not, Shelter has said that's the absolute minimum that you need. And that's... Actually, I'm not sure if that's been met either. So we need to focus on... But the key thing here is, it's not just about building homes hoping that the market's going to settle, right? Because what happens, and we've seen it a lot in Oxfordshire, they build huge housing developments, no infrastructure that goes in place, no schools, no roads, none of that. And then they are four-bedroom executive homes exactly. starting at 600,000. We had uh, a, a local... Uh, development where it started, a one-bedroom flat started at 300,000. That's just simply not going to allow someone like Carl to get on the housing ladder. So what you need is affordable rents that are genuinely affordable and linked to local income. So absolutely right, 80% of market value in the southeast is just laughable. Instead, have it linked to what the average income is in an area, and that would allow you to set that rent at something that is genuinely affordable. The thing that I just want to bring just in... Briefly, because I need to get around the audience. In Oxford, we're seeing a lot of this, and what's happening is that young people just move out. Mm. They move away. They want to stay and start a family and then have their parents there so that they can be mm. part of it and, you know, help look after the kids. They are putting off having children in the first place. Then they move far away. It's breaking our society right. that we're not getting this right. And so I thank him for his question, because I think it's a really okay. existential problem for this Well, country. let's hear what people in the audience think of it. Yes, the man there with his hand up. Yes, uh, towards the back. Um, I'm just going to give a direct answer to Carl's question. And the answer is, if you want it to change, vote. The problem is that so much of what we're seeing is to do with the change in demographics in this country, that we've it's completely distorted the electoral situation. The Conservatives have no interest in, supply, in, in looking after the interests of young people. That is the bottom line. And is apathy amongst the young people. They've got to get out and vote and vote for people who's in, who are going to support their interests. Then you might see things change. Okay. The, man, the man at the back. There, yeah. there are luxury apartments springing up all over Ealing, and I'm sure that's, that's true in many parts of the country. Who are they for? They're not for families. They're investment yeah. opportunities, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they're often left empty. The ones in Hamwell, just down the road. Yeah. Hamwell, look it up on a map, everyone. Right? It, it, they're, they're marketed in Dubai and Hong Kong. Yeah. They're not for people. They're not for families. They're for people to park their yeah. money. Yeah. OK. There's a, a couple of women further, further back. Right. Yes. Two women sitting next to each other with their hands up. Let's hear from both of you. Yes. Um, when I turned 18, I opened a LISA. But the limit for that is £450,000, yet the Greenford properties, which are recently being built, are over £450,000 or, um, or just under for, say, a one bed. By the time I'm in a position to buy a property, I'm pretty sure I'll be priced out of Greenford, even though I've been investing money into a LISA. Into so, a lifetime ISA you're talking about, ISA, yeah. yeah. OK, and that woman next to you, I think you had your hand up, did you? Or did you not? And I've... I've... You're looking terrified that I'm looking at you. <laughs> All right, let's see it. Yes, the man there in the black jacket and the white shirt. Yes, thank you. Um, I actually work in the housing sector in terms of housing planning delivery, and what I'd say are a couple of things that are shocking. First of all, the Prime Minister hasn't put housing in his top five priorities. That's, that's shocking, given it's a national crisis. And, and then the, the move by the 70 backbenchers to remove the housing targets, the local housing targets, has decimated the progression of local plans that are the sort of cement to determine where housing should be delivered. That is shocking. And unless there is effectively a cross-party political agreement on actually determining maybe regional housing targets, which then everyone can agree upon to start seeing housing delivery happen, we are going to be in this impasse. And that's for all tenures of homes that this country needs. Yeah. So we need more consensus across the political spectrum to get housing delivered. Richard, you just want to answer those points quickly? I feel like there's been a, a lot of points, and I will try and do them justice. So first of all, I do agree that this is a huge priority, and we absolutely want to get houses built for young people like But Kyle. the gentleman there saying it's, it's not on, on, you on want the Prime Minister's five priorities. Well, I'm just saying you're saying... No, in fairness, I'm just saying you say it's a huge priority. The gentleman there pointing out it's not one of the Prime Minister's five priorities. Drop the housing target. Well, I think, it, you know, we can all argue about the priorities that the Prime Minister has, 
but at the end of the day, he's got to have some priorities. And if we're getting the economy growing, if we're getting wages up, if we're dealing with inflation, those are the things that are going to put more money in people's pockets and help them to buy a house. What I would observe, actually, is we're here in London. The responsibility for housing is devolved to the Labour Mayor of London. He has a lot of levers that he can pull in terms of where he's building houses, how affordable they are, he's and what it. types of houses like he are building. So I think we need to sort of look at what local areas are doing. But I want to just say to Kyle, this is an absolutely vital priority. I am the housing minister. It is what I am focused on. Um, just a couple of things I'd like to, to put into the mix. We are going to do a renters' reform bill. That's coming very soon because I think Lisa's years? absolutely right about years? the Section 21 no-fault evictions. We will be abolishing those. That's a manifesto commitment that we stood on and we will be doing it. But I think we are also looking when, at exactly. many years of governments, let's be honest about this, that haven't built enough houses. Labour had a woeful record we when they were in government. We had a far better they record they than built, you. They you built, built 185,000 a year. No, no, no. You, you built, built less houses than since the 1920s. You had an absolutely shocking I'm sorry, record. sorry, that's factually and, incorrect. And it, I, can I just make my point? We, and then you, you can could, come okay, back. Lisa, let, let her make so a point and then you can make a point. I have got facts. I don't want to sort of get into that. You had a very... I know we like facts on this program, Rachel. Very much we like facts. <laughs> By all means, let's hear your facts. Of course. Okay. Uh, the, la the Labour governments, they built the lowest number of houses since oh, the 1920s. Uh, Labour in sorry, Wales last year built just up. five. Thousand houses, Labour-run Wales. Well, we have now let her finish, and then you can We have now got house building up to its highest record. Uh, we had something like 240,000 houses built last year. It has taken us this long to recover from Labour's financial oh. crash. I think Lisa's incredibly naive when she says it could be fixed tomorrow. I'm sorry. She demonstrates you can't a talk about financial she crashes when you had a complete lack of understanding of how the housing market works. Right. This is long-term infrastructure planning. We do need to get houses built, and that, that's the work that we are doing, and we are, that's why right. we have all the work that is right. going on. Can, can we the Affordable Homes Programme, can we just, delivering houses for young people. Can right, I just Lisa, briefly respond, bring this bring debate in. back to reality? I started out life... <laughs> I started out life working for a charity called Centrepoint, working with young homeless teenagers on the streets of London at a time when the last Labour government was at the beginning of eradicating rough sleeping in this country. During that time, we built 185,000 homes on average a year. Over the intervening decade after the Conservatives and the Coalition came to power, that plummeted by 20,000 homes a year on average. And you want to talk about Sadiq Khan? Sadiq mm. Khan has built 36,000 homes a year, 10,000 more they can't than his them. predecessor, they, no one Boris afford Johnson. Them. He smashed records on building council properties and affordable homes. More council housing built on his tenure since the 1970s. And the truth is this, the reason that the housing situation for most people in this country is absolutely dire is because of this Conservative government. After the devastation of the Second World War, the Attlee government bought more, built more council homes than yeah, any you built, other when you government in history to date. The last Labour government continued that le legacy by building more homes and br bu bringing half a million social homes up to a decent home no, standard. I'm afraid. And you should be ashamed of yourself I'm afraid. for trying you're, to you're airbrush that out. Of the yeah. 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 Great, so the Attlee government, her government, the last Labour government, government, built the lowest on, number yeah. of houses since the 1920s. Just that was what Labour did while they were in. We have built 2.2 million homes since we were in, but we need to do more. Okay. We're under no right. illusion. Not we need to do more. OK, taking the politics out of this, everyone on the panel and in the audience seems to agree that we should be building more housing. I think what's been interesting about people's attitudes towards housing is we may have left the era of nimbyism because quite a lot of people you might associate with being nimby not in my backyard might be older conservative voters who are now becoming more yimby because as kyle pointed out they want their children and their grandchildren to be able to live near them in perhaps their better off areas in leafy shires there's a number of practical problems here as well which we were discussing earlier for instance this situation where developers get planning permission to build developments and then they're able to sit on these planning permissions for years and years and years so nothing gets done. What they're doing by that is they're hoping that the price of this land goes off up so they can then sell it to others. There is also this issue of people buying properties off plan 
in other countries, as the gentleman pointed out, up there and never actually living in them. Having said that, I will give the government some credit. One good thing that they have done on housing is to give people who have got leasehold and freehold properties a bit more control. We've had a situation that has bubbled up over the course of recent decades where particularly people in leasehold properties keep on getting done over by the management agents asking them for ever higher ground rents but and all the rest of it. But we should abolish leasehold. I think we should. System. Yeah, we should. No but isn't Michael country. Gove suggesting... Yeah, doing that, home, you should to be it. fair, Lisa, I think Michael Gove has advocated that. For 13 years. Yes. Right, OK. Well, did you advocate it? <laughs> Where is it? No, did did have... Labour advocate yeah, look, it under I've, Tony I've Blair? Because I don't I've, remember that I've policy. Worked, I've worked in housing for a decade before I came into Parliament. I can tell you that I've been advocating it all, right. all that time. But the last Labour administration, system. to they be fair, the last Labour administration didn't do anything about no, this. The that's will. that's okay. how this problem started. Right. We could talk about housing some time, because we are in, in Greater London, after all, and it's a big issue here. There is another question that... Quite a few of you asked, and I want to try and fit it in. So let's hear from James Anderson. When, as a minister, is pushing for results a push too far? <laughs> so, James, I assume you're referring to the resignation of the uh, Justice Secretary, Dominic Raab, this week. He was investigated for bullying. Uh, there were eight complaints, two were upheld and he has resigned as a result. And he has hit back uh, and defended himself. Um, Leila. I read the whole of that Tolly report and um, some of the behaviour described in it was pretty unsavoury. It's worth bearing in mind two of the three departments, three whole departments, <laughs> all of them that he'd worked in, had had complaints against him. And um, his argument was that he was just sort of pushing them to do well. I mean, the behaviour, putting his hand out in front of people, some of it being quite punitive, you just don't accept that in the modern age anymore. And I, I think that the KC who did it was pretty fair, I had interviewed a whole range of people, and it, it reads pretty substantively. What I found really unsavoury, though, was what Dominic Raab then did next, was he went out fists first, it's all their fault, Metaphorically speaking. Def yes, metaphor <laughs> yes, quite right, yes. Uh, it's everyone else who's at fault. And the thrust of his argument here is that he was driving for high results, but then I look across his career and I'm wondering where those results were. <laughs> because this was the Brexit... Well, his, he claims... I'm not saying that's a justification for anything that you're saying. Or well, His point is that, amongst a number of ones, he's, he's claiming that some civil servants were acting against him. They were activist... And, and trying to, to stop him doing what he Yeah, and he never names does a that, single Does that name. cut any ice with you? No, it just does, absolutely doesn't. The civil service is a backbone of what we do, and everyone needs to give them the, that respect. And I think him blaming everyone else... Look, we know what bullies do. They take their <laughs> own insecurities and failures, and they put it on other people. That is what Rob was doing. It was right that he resigned. I wish he'd done it with a bit more grace, but I would point out, this is not the first. We've had Priti Patel... We've had Gavin Williamson. We now have a culture, it seems, at the top of government where this kind of behaviour is accepted. Then they resign. And did you see what Sunak did afterwards? That letter that he sent to accept his resigna resignation was positively glowing. I'm sorry, this is a Prime Minister who stood in front of the nation and said that he was going to bring back integrity to government again. Well, where is it? I don't see it. And I'm pleased Rob's gone, but... This is part of a wider culture in government, and it's the Tories that need to go, not just Rob. Uh, Rachel. I mean, did you, did you have sympathy for your, your colleague's defence, for Dominic Raab's defence? So, look, I've, um, I've worked with Dominic Raab, and I've worked with many ministers, and I've been very fortunate to be a minister in, in three government departments. And when you are there, you are under a lot of pressure because you are delivering for the British people. And when you work with civil servants, you all feel that responsibility and, and you try to do your best. And it is a high-pressurised environment. I mean, don't get me wrong, it's absolutely what it is. But there is a line between expecting performance and you should always be able to work in a respectful way with your civil servants. And that's always what I've tried to do. And, and I think most people, mm. almost everybody, does that. And I would, what I would say about this process is... It was a very thorough process, as Leila said. 
It's been an incredibly forensic process and the complaints have been investigated. Uh, Dominic Raab always said if he was found to have fallen short of the standards expected, he would resign, and he did. And, uh, you and know, do you think he was right to say the things he said afterwards, then? I, I mean, I, I think that what's right is that he's accepted the verdict of the report and he's resigned. So I'll take that as no? I, I think, look, you know, it, it, uh, he, he himself said that he was going to resign if it was yeah, found... Yeah, you've made that point, but just yes. in terms of whether or not he thought he was right to start blaming civil servants afterwards. I think, I, I think some of the things that he said were unfortunate and it doesn't reflect my experience. OK, let's hear a bit more. Is the man uh, in the waistcoat there? Bullying at workplace can create a very toxic culture and uh, it should never be done. Leaders should be able to inspire and lead by example. And the, 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 the young man at the back in the grey top. Uh, I think the biggest thing that surprised me was not that he was a bully, but it was the fact that he actually resigned. Because under 13 years of, you know, these clowns, right, <laughs> we've seen time and time again they've broken ministerial code and haven't resigned again and again and again, and I think that's what surprised me the most. I just want to point out, as I do rather tediously, I'm sure, every, every week pretty much, or on many weeks anyway, that because Question Time reflects the, the broad electoral map of the countries that voted uh, the last general election, we have got more people in this audience that voted Conservative in 2019 than for any other single party. They're not the majority of the audience, but more people voted Conservative than for any other party. Does anyone want to stick up for Dominic Raab? <laughs> OK, well, we've got one hand up. In, 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 or, yes, let, let's hear from you. Just in the interest of hearing another point of view. I think in, in defence of Dominic Raab, the threshold for defining bullying in the workplace is extremely low and very subjective, and it lends towards assertive leaders being subjected to manufactured trumped-up allegations of misconduct. Um, Is this I... something that worries... I'm not suggesting yeah. you're a bully for a moment. I'm just thinking how I'll phrase this. <laughs> not at all. Are you an employer? Is this something that worries you? No, I, I work in the NHS. I'm a doctor, and I myself right. have seen first-hand manufactured subjective trumped-up allegations to get rid of someone. And I think that Dominic Robb is a very good politician. I think he's assertive, and I think that... This was contrived um, by a group of civil servants who are probably somewhat woke, and they've, they've done this to get rid of him, and it's, it is unfair. I mean, just, I'm just, I'm just going to quote... Uh, just, I'll just quote the, 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 the KC, and there's a number of... I mean, I could pick out a few, but he, he says, Dominic Raab acted in a way which is intimidating, unreasonably and persistently aggressive. It involves, his conduct involved in abuse or misuse of a power in a way that undermines or humiliates. That, that's what the KC found, certainly in at least one of the cases. Camilla. Um... I think it was worrying that some of the people that made complaints hadn't actually worked directly with him, which would raise suspicions of collusion, perhaps. And those complaints were dismissed, as you know. Those complaints were dismissed. Also, what he was accused of in the press, because there was a kind of giant leaking operation to feed all of these stories into the papers, screaming and shouting, at one point throwing tomatoes, I think, wasn't found guilty of any of that, and that was uh, part of his defence. He's suggesting that that low threshold that you refer to, sir, creates an environment where ministers can't be robust with civil servants without fearing that they might end up having to resign or be sacked. And therefore, we all suffer, because if civil servants' work isn't good, then there should be checks and balances on it. You know, we aren't living in an environment where all civil servants are brilliant and always do a good job and never need, to, at times, to be wrapped over the knuckles. Having said that, I mean, nobody condones nastiness in the workplace. Um, I'm going to have to interrupt I, I mean, you. I've hardly, we're almost out of time, and I've got to but, but at least... I was, just, well. I was going to make another Forgive point. Me. You know, politicians over the course of the decades have had reputations. Lisa may be critical of Dominic Raab. You know, Andrew Rawnsley, Alistair Darling spoke about Gordon Brown having a bad temper and okay. screaming and shouting at people. OK, it well, let's... It's a thing. It's been a thing in Western All right, well, the question... I'm so sorry to, to, to rush you, Camille. We're running out of time. When, as a minister, is pushing for results or pushed too far? I mean, I, I read the report like Layla, and I think it makes for de very different account than the account yeah. that Dominic Raab put forward in the press. But my reflection on having worked with lots of different ministers of very different political parties is that sometimes what happens is that those ministers don't understand that there's a power imbalance, that they hold the cards, the civil servants, uh, employees. And I think this is part of a culture 
of a lack of professionalism in and around politics that I'd like to see change. But I did just want to say one more thing, which is that I think those politicians who abuse those positions of power give politics a bad name. Yeah. And I think we're all the poorer for it. I wish you could see some of the things that go on behind the scenes, like two summers ago when Layla and Tom Tugendhat and Dan Jarvis and I were on the phone to each other at all hours of day and night trying to get people out of Afghanistan and working together in order to do that. People who tell you that all politicians are the same they're the only people who benefit from okay. us losing faith and trust in the police. Lisa, I'm sorry, I'm sorry enough to, to wrap it up because we're, we're over time. Forgive me. I'm afraid I've run out of time and we could have carried on talking about this for quite some time. That is it for this week. Um, I'm sorry to end it rather abruptly. Remember, we are on BBC Sounds, uh, available as a podcast shortly after this programme if you'd like to, to listen to it there. See you next week in Telford from uh, Greenford. Bye-bye. <laughs>